thanks for being with us today. We are here with Dr. Joe Tafor. Uh, he will be one of our speakers uh, here at the Plantas Sagradas in Las Americas conference. And he is a medical doctor who has completed his medical residency in UCLA and then did uh, two years uh, studying the mind-body connection at UCSD and has also done six years at uh, Niue Rao Centro Espiritual uh, studying under the shaman Ricardo Amaringo and working with the plant medicine ayahuasca. And he has also recently written and published a book called um, The Fellowship of the River, a medical doctor's exploration into traditional Amazonian plant medicine. And so thank you so much for being here with us today. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> so do you want to tell us a little bit about what your book is about? Sure, yeah. My book is about, uh, it's like three, three components. And one, one is, is about my story going from medical school and getting depressed and looking for help and ending up turning to peyote and getting a lot of help and healing from peyote and then becoming curious about ayahuasca. My family's from Colombia and I'd heard about it and then it's that journey that turns into, you know, eventually meeting Ricardo and starting a center and, and running Niverao Centro Espiritual, a, you know, a healing center outside of Iquitos, Peru. And, and then that turning into uh, a training, you know, training in the ayahuasca shamanism. And then that's, that's kind of the background story. And then along with that is the presentation of cases, of medical cases that I saw, you know, just, just my own healing and other people's healing uh, that were treated with traditional medicine that had previously struggled with allopathic treatment for many years in most cases and then had a really rapid healing, or at least a rapid progress with, uh, you know, Shipibo, traditional plant medicine. And then the third part of it is just like a scientific reflection, trying to bridge some of the research into there and trying to like come up with some theories of how can we bridge shamanism and allopathic medicine. Yeah, so that's what the book's about. So how, so going from kind of a very strong science and medical background into diving very deeply into a spiritual path. How do you feel like the medical science background kind of informed your spiritual path? Yeah, I think that um, the medical science program or whatever background, I mean, it kind of drove me into a spiritual path, like through the kind of, you know what I mean, in the sense that just that the modern science is so uh, kind of neglectful you know, of the emotional and the spiritual kind of dimensions of life, the subjective experience of life is, is, it's been slow to be well integrated into like a scientific culture. And so I really suffered um, being somebody who was already kind of spiritually oriented, uh, coming from that background, from my family and my upbringing and the way I was living my life and entering that scientific world so deeply, uh, you know, it was really kind of uh, tough, tough on me and, and kind of I suffered, you know, mentally in that process and got kind of ill, you know. So there was that component was just it actually driving me to, to see like kind of the blind spots of that, of that way of thinking. And then also like teaching me, um, you know, so much about what we do know I and mean, just a very powerful body of knowledge from modern science from medical work in the sense of like how, you know, the breadth of treatment, you know, how, me how many people are being treated by allopathic medicine, mm -hmm. just within the United States, but globally, and the experience and the documentation and the investigation around that is massive, along with, you know, the research into the physiology and the anatomy and the biochemistry and all that aspect of trying to understand, um, human health, you know, and so there's all that knowledge to draw from and then ultimately what it's kind of like demonstrating to me is is trying to bridge that knowledge where you could see how the subjective side of life and trying to and trying to integrate it into a scientific, you know, perspective like health and the scientific measures of health helping us to understand like what it means to be subjectively well 
you know? In other words, that's just your body's functioning well, your immune system is functioning well because you're not suffering from some kind of internal struggle, uh, subjective struggle, psychological struggle, emotional struggle, you know, or even a spiritual crisis, you know, you might say. Like the way that that kind of stuff, now we have, we know enough science to talk about what that does inside you and how that makes you, how, how you feel also influences your physiology and your biochemistry and the interrelationship between those two things. It's very interesting because I feel as though that's a highly overlooked aspect of medicine today and I know a lot of people, I mean just in the United States alone, so many people are suffering from depression and anxiety and, and it's starting to manifest in, in the physical health and I think it's been very difficult for people to understand that there is more to health than just the physical side. There's the mental and the emotional and the spiritual side as well. And, uh, and so trying to trying to bridge that gap and to what it means to truly be healthy is kind of is quite the quite the undertaking. <laughs> right. Well, and it's just that it's just like I guess the issue is that people I don't know in the materialist kind of perspective and the materialist cultural perspective. It just, it just lends itself to this big, because it's kind of common sense, right? That like how you feel is going to affect your health. Everybody actually knows that. Right. <laughs> Everybody actually knows that. Like they know it. It's true. Like you know, if, uh, if some animal, like is like some paired, whatever, some dog and has his buddy and the dog, the other dog dies and this dog gets sick, you know? Everybody kind of knows. Yeah. So everybody knows, actually, and so it's just trying to to stop the charade, you know? It's really about that. Experientially, we know it, but not necessarily. Yeah, there's been, a, there's been a sacrifice of the experiential, what it means to, what it feels like to be alive, has been kind of sacrificed to this, uh, what can be proven, you know, through methods that, and we understand, like, okay, from one argument, we know they're trying to stop charlatanism, you know, and say, oh, well, we, there's a lot of, like, we want the evidence based because a lot of people have these folk ideas that maybe don't translate, and maybe people are being fooled, and they're being fooled into something, you know? So we don't want people to get fooled into something. But then we know on the other side that there's, like, the evidence-based model is revolved around this randomized, a double-blind placebo-controlled trial that is really only useful or is designed to assess the utility of single molecules, and it's a struggle to see how do you how do we evaluate uh, you know other more complex uh, treatment protocols like whether it's psychotherapy or now it's like Chinese medicine, acupuncture, and herbs and all this stuff or it's just any kind of complexity to the treatment at all. You know, that you'd include the human element to the research. That, okay, it's not just the pill you're taking. The psychiatrist you go to, like, could have a profound influence on your experience with that. But all we want to know is about the pill. But everybody knows that's a foolish, it's a very foolish perspective. Yeah. That, like, obviously, if you have your family member, you want to go to the right psychiatrist. You want to go to the right doctor because that individual is going to have a profound impact on your success, you know? But that stuff gets washed out. They don't want to hear about that in the trial. Because really, the trial is just to test the molecule, you know? And ultimately, uh, you know, too much, in fact, is to market the molecule. And so then we have this, like, evidence-based system that is, has been overly kind of <clears throat> influenced by the market, you know, and corporate values under the, like, supposition or the idea that we're trying to not keep everybody from getting fooled yeah. <laughs> you know? and so we have this so it's you know there's room for both of those things okay these guys are trying to sell their pills and prove their pills are better than than nothing you know or than placebo than something actually in fact and we don't want to get people fooled and misled you know we get all that but still the issue is that in, in given those <clears throat> approaches, you know, then we have this epidemic of anxiety and depression and PTSD and addiction and a whole slew of psychosomatic illnesses, you know, that are <clears throat> kind of like really puzzling 
the Western approach that's saying, well, we've, we've, we're not, no one's getting fooled, and hey, this is evidence-based, but those people are getting worse, yeah. despite continued funding, research, countless dollars, you know, into this thing. And, and so, so I was just saying, okay, well, maybe this perspective, if once again we're being honest, like that's the whole issue, we're not really being honest about what it means to be alive, because we're saying, oh, well, the paper says this is supposed to work, and so I'm supposed to feel better, and I paid the money, and I got the stuff, and I took it, but I don't feel better. And where is the room for that? Where does that person go? And nowadays, like, that person sometimes has the capacity or the means or whatever to, like, leave the culture, to go outside of the culture, to try to find somebody that might be able to help them, because within their culture, they're not getting help. And so then they come to a place like the Amazon, or they go to Soltara, or, or they go to Niwira, or they go to, you know, Shri People Shamans, for example. And all of a sudden they enter a medical system which embraces the subjective experience of life, which is extremely interested about the very personal and idiosyncratic like, elements of this person's health story, and is very interested in their emotional well-being and their history, and is open to the possibility that there may be a larger spiritual context to kind of work with in order to address this kind of healing. And then all of a sudden, I mean, that's what the book's about, it's like, wow, these people are like, in 10 days, they had a dramatic decrease in their migraines. You know, in three weeks, their Crohn's disease went from like debilitating, associated with a suicidal depression, and all that is like incredibly like improved. And I'm not saying, we don't have statistics, these are anecdotes, but still, it's powerful. It's very powerful for those individuals we don't need to just ignore it because we don't have statistics. Mm -hmm. We don't need to just say, forget anecdotal evidence because it's like, guess what? People want to hear that. They need to hear that stuff. You know, empirical, and, evidence. empirical evidence. Yeah. These are real people. Mm -hmm. This is real stuff. And so then that's the book tries to point at that. It's like, wow, we see this migraine case getting better. We see this depression getting better. We see this addiction getting better. We see PTSD getting better. We see Crohn's disease getting better. This idiopathic chronic cough, this psoriasis. Like these seemingly unrelated, according to the previous philosopher we were just describing, where it's like, oh, we're no quackery and uh, evidence-based, except no one's really drawing the connection between these like diseases I just listed, who are all improving under the same approach. We would typically see a different They would specialist. see a different specialist, every one of them. Mm -hmm. And so then we get back to the same point that there must be some physiology linking them. You know, if we believe in science so much, then we should be able to say, wow, this, this must be linked physiologically to some degree, maybe not completely, these problems. And so that's the point. And it's emotional physiology and it's emotional biology that links them. And it was emotional trauma that was underlying each one of those cases that once addressed, uh, you know, to some degree, led to rapid improvement in physical health and mental health. So kind of what you talk about in your book is this, this link, maybe the key to overcoming people's resistance and stigma about this sort of more spiritual taking into the whole, the picture of the whole human into account. Um, that link would be the emotional body is what you're saying. And the, so kind of looking towards the physiology of the emotional body. And I think you talked a little bit about like epigenetics and the PMI yeah. network. Could you maybe yeah. describe what that looks like? Looks so that's what, so then it's like emotional biology is the link now. That's what I'm saying between the shamanism and the allopathic model. And it's the, it's the under, that's the bridge and that's the overlooked piece, yeah. you know, that's there. And so then the one of the things I present in the book is that I believe that we have the emotional body is now described by Western medicine as the network that has been described by mind-body research, which is called the Psycho-Neuro-Endocrine Immunologic Network, PNEI. It's linking our psychology, the way we think, to our brain, the limbic emotional processing center of our brain, to our autonomic nervous system that controls our breathing and our digestion and the expression of our emotions physically and the physical experience of our emotions, which is completely linked to hormones and their production, you know, when you talk about cortisol and inflammation and stuff, and then also uh, to a lot of immune activity, you know, inflammation from stress, you know, for example. So that whole system is this emotional body, and I'm saying we now have proof we can show how severe emotional trauma 
And the most obvious example is PTSD. That's something that people could wrap their heads around. The way war trauma, you know, is the root of this person's, you know, health problems. Before they were traumatized by war, they didn't suffer as much from obviously the mental health issues that these guys are suffering from, but also the physical health issues. This high blood pressure, you know, heart problems, a lot of inflammation in their blood that can be measured, cortisol disturbances, autonomic disturbances, like it's not working right, their heart rate variability, all these different things you can measure, differences in the way the limbic brain is starting to structure itself you know, from chronic PTSD. So these things are all real. You know, this is proven. So now you can show, wow, this person, we know the war trauma is what led to this condition that they're experiencing. You know, and, it, you know, and there may be whatever, physical damage or environmental, you know, some agent, agent orange, things like that. But beyond that, we know just the emotional trauma, it will do that to somebody. And then we know that them working through and releasing the emotional charge of those memories is like what allows them to physically improve. And like in the case of the MDMA assisted psychotherapy trial, where there's, they don't longer qualify for PTSD by the measures that we have, okay? So that indicates like a psychological improvement, but there's also physical improvement associated with that. And so in the case that I present in the book, the guys, yeah, I mean, once you heal emotionally, Oh, there's a lot of like calm that comes back into the system. There's a lot of inflammatory stuff that calms down. But then there's also like the possibility of lifestyle change. You know, when you're so emotionally charged, for you to change your lifestyle, in other words, to eat better, to work out more, to do this, to do that, that people, to take care of yourself, people are suffering too much to really, sometimes they can make that change. A lot of times it's difficult, you know, but once you have that, when the peace is there and you get a little bit more room to operate, and it's easier to make those changes. So this guy lost a lot of weight and he came off of some blood pressure medication, came off some diabetes medication, you know, stopped psych medication. Oh my goodness. Yes. <laughs> that's huge. And that's 40 years of the paradigm. You know, he's a Vietnam veteran. Oh my goodness. So that's like, he's been dealing with that since Vietnam and he's not alone. Like all this interest into PTSD, it's like, guess what? And so this idea that some of these chronic illnesses that have been treated like that's chronic, you're depressed, oh, take pills for the rest of your life, you know, sorry about that. Mm -hmm. Versus saying, you know what, we don't really know how to help you. Hopefully there's somebody that can help you out there. That would be, if it's you or your family, you would be hoping a lot more for that instead of this complacent paperwork answer of just everybody just trying to get through their work day and you know, blah, blah, blah. Look man, I don't like it either. You don't like it, none of us like it. Here we go. You know, so that's like, and, and that system is being driven. Uh, well, we know that a huge part of what's driving that system is a profit margin that's sometimes sitting at the head of an uh, insurance company. Yeah. You know, that me, I'm a doctor, I'm going to slave away, you know, and who's making extra money? And it's like, oh, they raised the rates because Obamacare, they better raise the rates. Am I making more money? Are the nurses that are working there making more money? Last time I checked, they're not. Well, we had to raise the rates because, you know, the cost and everything and blah, blah, blah. Wow. So it's just like, what are we all working so hard for? That's what I'm curious about in this medicine. And we can't, we can't make time to figure out what's going on. And I get it. It's complicated. It's not an easy solve. And, but I think very important, at least don't, not everyone has to do ayahuasca. And I don't recommend it to everyone at all. And I try to get into that in the book. But just saying, hey, you know what? A lot of these problems are emotionally rooted. And we need to start addressing this emotional disease. Yeah. And it's, it's rooted in a lot of childhood neglect. It's a lot of, it's a culture that has abandoned family, you know, in place for work and the race against time. It seems to be a lot of tunnel vision towards the molecule with the doctors, towards the, you know, the work that needs to be done, and towards the pills that would just get you through the next work day yeah. you know, going forward in your life. And, really maybe taking a step back and expanding what it means to be healthy on all levels is something that people seem very open to in general, but changing the whole system is, is going to be slow. Yeah. But first is just showing that you just, we're not worried about changing the whole system. We're not trying to bring on the wrath of the 
pharmaceutical industry. We don't, we don't care that everyone can operate just how they're operating. No, let them do everything. I don't, I'm not interested in confronting them, you know. I, what I am interested in trying to help them and their families and people that they know, you know, that are suffering. Yeah. That's what I'm interested in. And I'm sure, and I know for a fact that they, many of them have the kind of problem that, that, you know, this kind of medicine could help. And if they're not all the right candidates, but I can say that, yes, you know, probably some of their problems, they can't sleep right, they can't do this, they gotta take a pill to go here, they gotta take a pill to go there, you know what I mean, just to get through their day. And it's like, that's not necessarily the life that their grandparents live, definitely not the life their great-grandparents live, and it's not the life that most people here in Mexico are living, you know. The United States, supposedly, according to Newsweek, is consuming 50% of the world's prescription drugs. Wow. That was a Newsweek report of that a few years ago. That's that yeah. definitely, it's like people are kind of, talk about tunnel vision, very out of touch with the possibilities for human life, you know, yeah. on this planet. Wow. You kind of mentioned a few very interesting examples of, um, of you know, illnesses that were cured, physical illnesses that were cured as a result of getting to the emotional group. Is there one that stands out for you that you wouldn't mind illustrating? Or like dramatically improved, at least, you know, I would say. Well, the, like the case I think I'm going to try to talk about here was the Crohn's disease case. Okay. You know, so just to kind of give, and then I'll, and I'll touch on the epigenetics that you mentioned. So he's a guy that has been, he's in his 40s, started having really bad intestinal symptoms in his 20s. Then he ended up having uh, full-blown his bowels just got so inflamed, they perforated, you know, and he, had, he ended up having surgery. He's had surgery three times in his life over really severe Crohn's disease. It was diagnosed once he had surgery. They realized, oh, you have Crohn's, you know, this autoimmune inflammation of your guts and your stomach, and you can take, you know, the main treatment. And some people, he calms down, you know, some people really struggle. The main treatment is, is uh, immunosuppressants. Things are going to calm down <laughs> the immune activities like steroids. You know, so then that's like, yeah, it's effective for a lot of people. The problem is it suppresses immune function in general. And, and it's, a, it's a strong, broad metabolic treatment that some people don't like being on. In his case, he didn't like it. So, but, you know, Crohn's disease, as a doctor, like in my training, you may be, there's, there's papers, there's studies to demonstrate, hey, this is a very, like, it's very linked, comorbid with mental health problems. In other words, anxiety and depression is very common in uh, inflammatory bowel disorder. That being said, it's not typical to send a Crohn's person to the psychiatrist or to mental health. They immediately go to the GI doctor. So then they scope them, um, they do whatever, they biopsy after the surgery, and then he's offered the, uh, you know, the pills, the steroids. And, and then, you know, maybe somebody will see that, yeah, this guy has some, you know, depressive issues he's not so happy with the mental health system he's not a great patient he's not helping you know like he's not coming around he doesn't like to follow up he's suffering with his mental health his depression he eventually becomes suicidal so he's really having a hard time but the reality of these two problems going hand in hand you know that this one is directly linked to the other and there's a lot of evidence that that's the case that we see that trend you know, from research in Crohn's and, and things like that. Mental health and gut, or just mental health and inflammation, you know, uncontrolled inflammation, severe inflammation that's localized to certain areas of the body that doesn't have, there's no infection, there's no insult, there's no damage, but there's this inflammation just blowing up. So that's kind of like suspicious, you know. What's wrong with the body? Why is the body doing that? And all oh, it's genetics. It's this, and food, of course, is a big deal, you know, in Crohn's. He wasn't eating well, you know, that was a big problem for him. And so, but that's all that, you know. The reality is, like, in his life that was never really investigated with anyone, is that he was, uh, his dad disappeared. He had a series of stepfathers. One of them, who he was led to be, was his biological father. It turns out wasn't. That guy also severely physically abused him throughout his entire like childhood and he actually ran away from home like around 13 14 and became had help from an uncle and became independent and started living and working you know faking his age and just joining the workforce and became a uh, engineer on the trains in Canada 
And so he had all that trauma. He had a lot of anger issues, but he just kind of worked through some of that. But he had all that trauma inside him. Comes down to do uh, ayahuasca anyway route and go through a diet, you know, master plant diet, which is really like the big healing component with ayahuasca on top of it. So the traditional Shipibo diet being the real like structure that held his healing. And so he was put on ohe tree that, you know, believed to have some like intestinal benefits. And so he was doing his diet and then in the ayahuasca ceremonies, he went through some major like mm, hyperdimensional like stuff, like brain reprogramming experiences that were just really surreal and, you know, maybe hard to describe, mysterious. And then some very like clear cut emotional experiences, which was ayahuasca telling him, as far as this whole search for your father, who's your real father, you don't need to worry about that anymore. This guy that your mom's still with, that used to beat you up, that's your dad. You know, work it out with him, forgive him, try to make amends with him. He'll be a father to you. And then in another revelation, he was informed that he was abused sexually by his aunt and had no memory of that. So if that kind of thing is, you know, mysterious and has to be confirmed, you know, it's not, there's a lot of room for projection and imagination in the ayahuasca space. But he did confirm that later and found out that he had been abused along with his cousins by this one aunt he previously was not aware of. And then just forgiving and healing and purging like all the energy associated with all this abuse that he suffered. And after that, his, uh, his depression resolved. No more suicidal thoughts. He had one more day that he described. In the following year, he described he had one day that he thought he was down. It was while he was in divorce court fighting over custody with his kids. His intestinal symptoms pretty much resolved. He takes a little bit of like medical marijuana if he begins to feel a little something, but he had no major intestinal symptoms for the following year. Wow. And so then, how does that work? And so the, the Shipibo is gonna say that this, this is the energies, you know, that's an energetic problem from all the energy of that trauma that's been stored into his body, which I'm saying stored into his emotional body would be one of the places that that's stored just like this PTSD thing I was talking about. And so then how do you clean that out? How do you heal the emotional body? How do you cleanse energy from the system? Energy in the sense that it was picked up from dynamic social exchange. You know, it wasn't like they injected him with stuff. It was like he was getting beat up. He was getting yelled at. He was getting sexually abused. And the way that that impacts his physical body and so now we have like a growing body of evidence that one of the ways that emotional trauma gets stored in the body is through the epigenetics. Okay, okay so the epigenetics is like this new biology around the coding of the genes, the coding that which sits on top of the genes okay. that affects the expression of the genes, you know? And so there's a lot of different examples of how that would happen. But just to put it simply, like that, there's some diseases that look genetic that aren't genetic. Like I said, they're not hardware problems, they're software problems. It's a programming that went into the system that is not uh, necess that can be changed. Wow. And by, so, by us, by, by us, by emotional healing. Okay. And so, in this case, there is evidence that. Epigenetics is underlying to some degree Crohn's disease. Epigenetics is underlying to some degree anxiety and depression. And so then we know that epigenetics can be modulated and shift and improve in response to antidepressants, in response to psychotherapy, in response to meditation. So it seems like a prime target to be susceptible to shamanic healing. And so the way that how would forgiveness or self-compassion or gratitude or self-love when people go through visceral experiences of that when they go through emotional catharsis and they shed something what changes in their body that leads to like actual physical change in their health mm -hmm. so I suggest that it's the epigenetics that's the link so we're trying to do a study to evaluate epigenetics in the map study and perhaps in Peru through modernspirit.org okay. yeah we're looking for funding right now well, it sounds like that's a body of research that is up and coming, but maybe there's a lot more investigation. Yeah, and slow. It's slow to go, yeah, but there's, it's all 
there's a very large body of research and that's what the book is kind of trying to from the medical scientific perspective say hey look look how migraines are related to Crohn's disease to psoriasis physiologically and look how epigenetics is underlying those issues look how each one of those has been looked at as like hey maybe this is a maladaptive stress response from childhood trauma and there's evidence that suggests that and that we know that's already there for anxiety and depression and addiction and PTSD is a more obvious example. It sounds like since the emotional body is what kind of can lead to these epigenetic changes and then the healing of the emotional body is such a personalized thing that this more spiritual approach or approach that encompasses the subjective experience is something that could hold a lot of promise to that. Yeah, that the epigenetics would be responsive to or your subjective experience. The individualized story of your life would be actually mapped out in your epigenetics. And that's what you'll be talking about at the conference. Briefly. Here. Briefly. Yeah. <laughs> what else will you be kind of talking about your experience? Um, yeah, well, just promoting the book is being translated to Spanish. Congratulations. And so we're almost, it's almost done. It's in the final edits. And yeah, so then I'm here to present the book here to tell people it's coming. Promoting modernspirit.org. Modernspirit.org is as well. <laughs> trying to see what we get going. Yeah, taking the, yeah. What do you, um, just kind of to wrap up uh, about this conference, this is obviously a very multidisciplinary international conference. Um, what do you kind of hope to get out of this yourself, or what do you hope comes out of this, this conference and all of these discussions? Yeah, I guess I just want to learn from, as we can see, like it's a, it's a Mexican-based conference, Spanish-speaking conference, and so you get to see and hear from all, a lot more indigenous perspectives than you would hear from at, you know, at maps and things like that. Not just because, here they are, and, and many of these indigenous groups also speak Spanish. And so it's a chance for them to share, and they're, they're being honored here. They don't have to fit into a mold of how does their thing fit into some kind of scientific paradigm. People are here to learn from them and to hear from their perspective, which is, you know, a big part of what my book's about, is the way the people perspective can inform modern healthcare. So that's what this is about, is like hearing from other cultural perspectives when we know our culture is suffering. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us, Yeah, thank you, thank you very much, yeah, thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, yeah, thanks a lot.